Well, for all those who have already arrived, I'd like to welcome you to our um, session at the uh, Property and Dispossession Speaker Series of the Centre for Global Studies here at the University of Victoria. Um, it's a particular, particular pleasure to be able to introduce today's speaker, but for reasons that should be obvious, at least to all of the Canadian um, uh, people who have registered for it, I'd like to start with our university territory acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen, Songhees, Esquimalt peoples on whose territory the university stands, and the Lekwungen and Wasanic peoples whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. That's important for us here at this university, and for those of you who are coming from outside of Canada for this, it's worthwhile saying that part of the resonance of today's presentation is that for the last couple of days, Canada has been engaged in um, remembering and participating in on a national level in truth and reconciliation. And um, it seems particularly appropriate to um, be able to have a a presentation today that deals with those types of issues. And in an ironic way, um, I think as will become evident when uh, when our speaker, Philippe Sands, uh, gives us his talk, that in an ironic way, it's interesting that out here in a post-colonial society such as Canada, we're engaging in, we're at least attempting to engage in meaningful truth and reconciliation. Um, it's interesting though that the imperial power that brought colonialism, um, I think is yet to meaningfully engage with that. And with that, let me say something about our speaker. Philippe Sands, who many of you will be aware of, um, partly because of the truly excellent book he published a short time ago called East West Street um, about the development of the concepts of, of genocide and crimes against humanity. Um, and Philippe Sands is Professor of Law at the University of London. He's the Samuel Pissard Visiting Professor at Harvard Law School. He is, as I've said, the author of East West Street, is a frequent commentator on CNN and the BBC World Service, and he's a litigator, as we'll discover in his talk, before international courts. And he'll be talking to us today on his newest book, which is an absolutely stunning, stunning book um, called The Last Colony, um, subtitled The Tale of Exile, Justice and Britain's Colonial Legacy. So. Um, I'm enormously pleased to be able to um, invite Philippe Sands to speak to us. Philippe. Andrew, thank you so much for the invitation. It's lovely to be with you uh, virtually. I wish it was uh, in person. I have been to British Columbia on a number of occasions and I hope to do so again. Um, and actually, since we're talking about matters historical and dispossession and since I'm virtually at least in Canada. I think I can't help but just before going to the subject that we're really going to focus on today, just say something about developments in Canada over the last few days. Um, and in particular, the appearance, since you mentioned East West Street, which is largely set in the Ukrainian city of Lviv, of the um, Ukrainian president in the Canadian parliament um, a few days ago, and the remarkable spectacle of the entire Canadian Parliament um, standing up and applauding very vigorously a 98-year-old Canadian-Ukrainian gentleman um, uh, who was being celebrated for his exploits uh, during the Second World War. So I watched this with a particular interest, I have to say, because um, the book that I wrote that followed East West Street is called The Rat Line, and it is the story of um, a senior SS officer called Otto Vector and his uh, wife, Charlotta. Uh, and one of Otto Vector's claim to fame, claims to fame was that he was the founder 
of the Waffen-SS Galicia Division, the 14th Division, um, of which Mr. Hunker was a proud member, it seems. Um, and ever since the rat line has come out, um, it has struck me as, well, I get quite a lot of correspondence from around Canada pointing out the various memorials in cemeteries to the, it's often only referred to as the Galicia Division. Um, but, you know, let us not mince words, the Galicia Division was a Nazi division. It was the first non-German Waffen-SS division created in April 1943. And in fact, I just posted yesterday on uh, Twitter or Z as it's or X or whatever it's now called, um, a photograph of um, Governor Wächter with Heinrich Himmler and others inspecting the Waffen-SS Galicia Division. And the unfortunate events of last week, which, you know, talk about own goals, this was basically as bad as it gets, given uh, Mr. Putin's uh, characterizing Ukraine um, as being a modern Nazi state, which it is not, um, was extremely unfortunate. And the absence of preparation and reflection, I don't know whether it was the Speaker of the Parliament, who of course has now lost his position, or someone else, I don't know whether he just took the fall. The whole episode just reminds us to really be extremely careful in 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 how we sort of evoke uh, historical uh, matters, and uh, the sort of unwillingness, I think, of many people in Canada to look a little bit behind the surface of what these old folk did uh, in 1943 is, I think, uh, connected in part to what we're talking about today. Um, Canada's not alone. I mean, I think every community, every country has a sort of um, blindness, narrow vision of, of looking at aspects of its past. Which brings me to the last colony, um, which is the story of a place called the Chagos Archipelago, a group of 58 or so very tiny islands located in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, which was from 1814 until 1965, November 1965, part of the British colony of Mauritius. Uh, in uh, 1965, the British, um, at the request of the United States, um, agreed to give the United States a long-term lease in relation to one of those 58 islands called Diego Garcia. The logic of Britain's position in giving the United States a lease over Diego Garcia was that it would have to find a way to separate the Chagos archipelago from Mauritius before Mauritius gained its independence. This was a moment, as many of you will know, in which decolonization um, was going up the agenda and the right of self-determination as articulated in a famous General Assembly resolution of 1960, Resolution 1514, was beginning to cut in and have effect. The people of Mauritius, population a few hundred thousand, but including the 2,000 or so people who were located, uh, who were inhabitants uh, of the Chagos Archipelago, and including the 400 or so folks who lived on Diego Garcia, wanted independence from the United Kingdom. In the end, the British decided that they were minded to give the Americans Diego Garcia for 70 years. Um, and to do that, they would have to um, dismember Mauritius, separate the Chagos Archipelago from Mauritius, create a new colony, Britain's last colony, if you like, in the sense of the last colony it ever created, and also its last colony uh, in Africa, um, was the way forward. And faced with demands from Mauritius for um, independence, they essentially, through the government of Harold Wilson, offered the leadership of Mauritius a deal. We will give you your independence in a couple of years if you accede to and give your consent to the separation of your territory. And under that pressure, the then leadership, by a majority vote, 
agreed to obtain independence in those conditions. And so what happened next was that the United Kingdom, by order in council, separated the Chagos Archipelago, 58 islands and islets, and about 640,000 square kilometers from Mauritius, declared the creation of the British Indian Ocean Territory, and three years later, um, gave Mauritius independence from March 1968 without the Chagos Archipelago. Now, one aspect of this arrangement that caused particular difficulty for the British was the fact that the Chagos uh, Archipelago islands were inhabited by around or up to about 2,000 people. The numbers are not precisely known, let's say between 1,500 and 2,000 people. This was a community of people who were almost all black, almost all descended from enslaved persons over several generations, going back to uh, the 18th or early 19th uh, century, and who were never, of course, asked uh, to give their consent in relation to what was happening. And what basically happened uh, was that the British decided that they had to remove the entire population because they understood that in order to um, dismember uh, the Chagos Archipelago in violation of the principle of territorial integrity of a colony that was to be granted its independence, that dismemberment could only take place with the consent of the affected population. And what the United Kingdom did was to interpret the concept of the affected population as any people who were permanent inhabitants of the Chagos Archipelago. And so the British government, on advice from their lawyers, but not all their lawyers, some said this was a ruse that was unlawful, came up with a scheme which was basically to say there was no permanent population on the Chagos Archipelago, that the uh, all of the people who lived there were contract laborers, not uh, inhabitants or residents of the territory. Um, so that in the case of some who were just six months old or four years old, I, I've come to know some of them over the years, they were all redesignated as contract laborers. And as contract laborers, said the lawyers um, in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, they have no right to be consulted. And on that basis, the United Kingdom depopulated the entire population uh, of the Chagos Archipelago. Depopulated is probably generous. It was a forcible deportation in manifest violation of international law, human rights standards, the Geneva Conventions, whatever you will, forcible um, deportation uh, after Nuremberg and the, the rules that were then established was not uh, permissible. And between 1968 and 1973, the entire population was removed. All of the islands remained unpopulated. Diego Garcia became a place which started off life as a communications base, but eventually became one of the biggest US bases in the world. And so that was the situation by the end of 1973. Now, Mauritius came into independence um, as a country that was heavily dependent uh, on uh, the United Kingdom. Its main export was sugar, sugarcane, and um, the main market and access to the common market of Europe was through the United Kingdom. And so for about 10 years, um, the Mauritian newly independent government of Mr. Ram Gulam uh, did not make much of a fuss about what had happened, although there were rumblings about the illegality of what uh, had happened. The situation then took a change about uh, 14 years after independence, when Mauritius started to agitate at the United Nations um, for um, the completion of its decolonization. It started to argue in a speech at the UN General Assembly in September 1982 through a new prime minister, uh, Anaruj Jugnat, Sir Anaruj Jugnat, that the dismemberment of the Chagos Archipelago from the colony of Mauritius was unlawful because Mauritius had not genuinely given consent. The consent that was given 
was obtained under duress. This was swatted away by the British government for nearly four decades. Um, and then in 2010, in a more sustained way, the government of Mauritius changed direction and decided it would seek to bring international proceedings in order to uh, obtain rulings that it had sovereignty over the whole of the Chagos archipelago, that the dismemberment was unlawful, and that the dispossession, if you like, of the population who wanted to return uh, to their islands um, was uh, without um, foundation under international law. So this came across my desk for the first time in April 2010. Actually, I was on holiday with my brother in French mountains um, on a chairlift when I received a phone call on my mobile phone. Now, generally, I tend to avoid answering my telephone when I, I'm on a chairlift because I'm sort of worried about dropping my phone from a great height. But I sort of looked at the phone, didn't recognize the number, plus 230, and thought, well, where's that? And couldn't resist um, you know, answering the telephone. Uh, so I did answer the telephone, and it turned out it was the office of the Prime Minister of Mauritius uh, asking whether I was available to speak to the Prime Minister um, on the subject of the Chagos Archipelago. Now, pause for a moment here. Um, like many of you, I suspect, still maybe today, but certainly my position in 2010, I really knew nothing about the Chagos Archipelago. Um, and when I finally spoke to the Prime Minister, I'd done a bit of research and understood the story that I'm telling you now, and in particular did know about Diego Garcia, um, largely because Diego Garcia had been used in 2003 to start the bombing of Iraq in that war, and it turned out was also used as a black site in the US program on extraordinary rendition, where um, individuals were tortured in various parts uh, of the world or transported via places like Diego Garcia. To this day, we don't know. We know that Diego Garcia was used, but we don't know exactly what happened on uh, Diego Garcia. So I knew about Diego Garcia, but I didn't know about the Chagos Archipelago. And, and I felt a bit embarrassed about this, actually, and even a sense ashamed once I had found out what the British government had done in my lifetime. I mean, this is not a historic wrong going back to the 18th or 19th century alone. It's a historic wrong that was occasioned in my lifetime and which continued, and I knew nothing about it. And that did, in fact, as I have described in the book, cause me to... Um, ask myself questions, how could it be that I knew nothing about this? How could it be that I was totally unaware of what Britain and the United States had done uh, to this country and was continuing to do by not allowing the Chagossians who were sort of deported forcibly to Mauritius, to Seychelles and a few to the United Kingdom. How could I not know about this? I went back to my school um, history books, actually. I think I have a copy of it. I do have a copy of it uh, right in front of me. It's uh, it's it's a book called "This Is Your Century," um, which is uh, some of you may even have read it. Published in 1967 by Jeffrey Treese, um, and uh, chapter um, 16 is called "Sunset on Empire," uh, and this is what we were told, or we were taught at the age of 12 or 13 about the wonders of the British Empire, which of course included uh, in the past Canada, bits of Canada. Um, and, and Sunset on Empire begins with a narrative account of India and a comparison between the rather marvellous last governor, um, Lord Mountbatten, tall, elegant, well-dressed, regular kind of guy, on the one hand, and the new uh, leader of India, which was obviously written in the 1960s, a gentleman who was short, vegetarian, pacifist, and I'm very sorry to say, I'm literally paraphrasing the quote from the book, looked a bit like a monkey with glasses. 
That's what I was taught in early 1970s about Britain's empire. And I think that is the reason why people of my generation never really inquired about what had happened. We were never taught the reality of Britain's empire. And I have to say, even my own children who are in, the, who are in their 20s now at school never really got a, a regular accounting of what had actually happened. And so for most of my adult life, including my life as a legal scholar and my life as a barrister, I was sort of blissfully unaware of stories like the British Indian Ocean Territory. And of course, I accepted to get involved in the case. And it, it was a sort of David and Goliath case. I mean, you've got Mauritius population about one million, small African island state taking on the United Kingdom and the United States to permanent members of the Security Council. So it wasn't immediately apparent that we'd have much of a chance, certainly on the political or diplomatic stage, or perhaps any more uh, on the legal stage. But the Prime Minister of Mauritius, Mr. Rangula, at the time in 2010, said, give it a go, see what options you can find. And so I brought together a group of um, international lawyers uh, from around the world, working with a, a really wonderful team from uh, Port Louis, the capital of Mauritius, extraordinarily fine lawyers, and of course, some of the people who had litigated in the English courts for the Chagossians over many, many years, led by a rather remarkable individual who I write about in my book, The Last Colony, um, Olivier Bancou who had litigated with some success in the English courts, um, Banku number one, Banku number two, Banku number three, and indeed by around 2000 had obtained a ruling um, from the Court of Appeal in London that the Chagossians should be able to, be, to return, that they had been dispossessed unlawfully by reference to English law. Of course, what happened next was the events of September the 11th, the importance of Diego Garcia as an American base thrust uh, to having a central role, uh, and um, the House of Lords, as it then was, um, essentially uh, overturning uh, various decisions and a new order in council being passed, pre preventing the Chagossians uh, from uh, being able uh, to uh, return. But what the case of Bonku against the United Kingdom over many years did was through the process of discovery, throw up many documents, which are remarkable documents, from the 1960s, in which, uh, behind the scenes, the explanation of the British government's approach was laid out in brutal and stark black and white lettering for all to see. That would become very significant evidence in due course. And so our legal team proceeded uh, with the case. One of the lawyers in the team had a significant role um, in recent years before in Canada, James Crawford, professor of international at Cambridge University, who had been one of the experts on the question of the secession of Quebec, which, of course, went to the Canadian um, highest court in Canada, and um, it, it, Crawford's arguments on self-determination and the need to consult with the totality of the population became a central issue also in the cases that were litigated internationally. For various complex historical reasons and legal technical reasons, Mauritius was not in a position to bring a case to the International Court of Justice against the United Kingdom. The UK had excluded contentious jurisdiction against members of the Commonwealth or former members of the Commonwealth. And so the legal strategy began by taking another path. In 2010, in the face of increasing pressure of a political nature in the United Kingdom about uh, the, the discontent about what had happened at the Chagos Archipelago, and in particular, the embarrassing emergence of the news that Diego Garcia had been used as a black site. The outgoing Labour government of um, Gordon Brown 
had authorized the creation of a marine protected area over the whole of the Chagos archipelago. 650,000 square kilometers of ocean and coral reefs and small islands that would be protected forever, save for a sort of donut hole at the heart of it, the, the island of Diego Garcia with the American base and whatever may or may not be there. Um, the declaration of the uh, marine protected area in the spring of 2010 was actually, I learned, the catalyst that caused uh, the Prime Minister of Mauritius to be so furious with the British that he decided to create a legal team to recover the whole of the Chagos archipelago. And the fury was prompted by, ironically enough, WikiLeaks, which some of you may remember, the sudden emergence of thousands of pages of um, confidential uh, US diplomatic cables, which were suddenly made available for all to see on a searchable uh, web. This is the sort of Julian Assange contribution, if you like, to international law indirectly. Amongst this, you know, millions of documents were several on the Chagos archipelago and the marine protected area uh, announced by the United Kingdom in spring of 2010. And those cables showed, amongst other things, a rather embarrassing series of conversations between foreign office diplomats in London responsible for BIOT, the British Indian Ocean Territory, and US diplomats, uh, the embassy in London, and in Washington. And in particular, a number of the exchanges had the British telling the Americans that one of the great advantages of this marine protected area was that, and I apologize for using this language, but it's what the WikiLeaks cable says, it's what the actual US cable said, is that the Man Fridays would never be able to return to their former homes. In other words, the environment was being used to prevent the Chagossians from going back because the absolute ban on any human activity would mean that they couldn't go back because there's nothing that they could do consistent with the marine protected area. This was the act that prompted the Prime Minister of Mauritius to take action. But it also allowed the lawyers to advise that the way in was through a convention, which was not immediately at the forefront of everyone's minds, on the law of the sea, adopted in 1982. And Mauritius sought a double declaration. The marine protected area was inconsistent with the requirements of the Law of the Sea Convention because the rights of Mauritius had been violated. Mauritius as a coastal state in relation to the Chagos Archipelago had not been consulted on the creation of an environmental marine protected area. But secondly, the argument of Mauritius was that uh, the United Kingdom had no right to declare a marine protected area because it was not the owner of the Chagos archipelago. It was in illegal occupation. That case went on for about four years and it got a partially successful result for Mauritius. By unanimous decision, the five members of the arbitral tribunal ruled that the marine protected area had been declared unlawfully because Mauritius had not been consulted on the proposal. And so they struck down as illegal the marine protected area. But by a vote of three to two, the majority of the five arbitrators ruled that a, an arbitral tribunal created under the law of the sea has no jurisdiction to deal with sovereignty over land. Who owns the islands? And therefore, there was no jurisdiction to determine whether Mauritius or the United Kingdom was truly the coastal state in relation to the Chagos archipelago. And so that was a defeat, a narrow defeat, but a defeat nevertheless for Mauritius. But very significantly, and some of you on this call will understand what it is that I'm saying, sometimes you lose a case, but you sort of unwittingly win it. Um, and in particular, the two arbitrators who dissented gave a very strong statement that contrary to the majority, they believed that the arbitral tribunal did have competence 
to determine who was the coastal state. And in exercising that competence and jurisdiction, they should have declared that what happened in 1965 was illegal, that it had no legal effects, and that the true ownership of the Chagos Archipelago, the true sovereign, was Mauritius, that the dismemberment, the dispossession, was entirely without effect because it violated the right of self-determination, Resolution 1514 of the UN General Assembly of 1960, and that right of self-determination included a principle of territorial integrity, which could only be abdicated with the consent of the whole population. There'd been no consent obtained without duress, and therefore the whole thing was illegal. But as I said, that was a minority view. Interestingly, if you look at the composition of the panel, the majority comprises three white Anglo-Saxon men, and the minority is a black African man and a German man. And it is striking for me that the tribunal split in that way. So that was how things stood in 2015. At that point, a new government took office in Mauritius, the same Mr. Sir Anarud Juknath, who had addressed the United Nations General Assembly in 1982, came back into power, much more elderly gentleman. He summoned us to Paul Louis, asked us to explain the arbitral tribunal, and then instructed us to find another way to get to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Now, as I said, the United Kingdom had excluded jurisdiction in contentious bilateral cases. And so the only way to get a case to the International Court of Justice was to persuade the General Assembly of the United Nations to send a resolute to pass a resolution requesting the ICJ to give an advisory opinion on whether the decolonization of Mauritius had been completed. The Prime Minister said, I want you to get me an advisory opinion request from the General Assembly. We said, Prime Minister, that's actually going to be pretty difficult. We are Mauritius, population 1 million, taking on the UK and the US. The prospects of getting that through the General Assembly are pretty slim. They were pretty slim in 2010. And even with this uh, arbitral award from the Law of the Sea Tribunal, we think um, it's going to be a pretty slim prospect today. He said, I don't care. I want you to get me a General Assembly uh, resolution requesting an advisory opinion. So off we went uh, with an absolutely superb permanent representative of Mauritius uh, at the uh, United Nations, a man called Jagish Kunjul. And uh, he is probably quite simply the very best legal agent I've ever worked with, as he plotted a strategy to pass a resolution at the UN General Assembly on self-determination, territorial integrity, the rights of the Chagossians to return, uh, and the question of whether Mauritius's decolonization had been completed. In other words, was the United Kingdom unlawfully occupying the Chagos archipelago? Now, at this point, June 2016 hoves into place, and it's, you know, sort of a manna from heaven type of moment, not one I frankly overall support, but in its wisdom, the British people decided to vote for Brexit uh, and to leave the European Union. That had an absolutely dramatic effect um, in the United Nations. Basically, the United Kingdom fell off the edge of a cliff and support evaporated. All of a sudden, 27 European Union members who would have been batting for the United Kingdom said, oh, no, you're on your own now. We're not supporting you on this. And Britain was left to argue on its own. The upshot was when the matter reached the General Assembly in June 2017, a year after Brexit, the General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to send a request to the International Court of Justice to give an advisory opinion on whether the decolonization of Mauritius was complete, question one, and question number two, if not, what are the legal consequences? And so we then spent a year and a half litigating the case before the International Court of Justice, culminating in a hearing that was held in September 2018. Now, one of the things in preparing a legal strategy is you, you know, have the facts and you've got the legal arguments. 
And it was very clear to everyone involved in the case that the Chagossian population have been having been excluded from decision making in 1965 had a voice which had to be heard before the International Court of Justice. And in the end, with the assistance of the International Court, um, the uh, Mauritian government decided to present a witness before um, the International Court of Justice, one of the Chagossians to tell her story. That story is um, just uh, delivered in a video statement of just three minutes and 47 seconds. And I've been litigating cases at the International Court of Justice for more than 30 years. That is the single most deci de decisive moment of any case I have ever seen. And if you're interested, go on the web afterwards, just type in Lisby Elysee, um, uh, statement International Court of Justice, and you can watch her statement. It was an, it was the transformative moment in the hearings, coupled with the documents that I mentioned earlier, which revealed in all their horror um, the machinations of the British government uh, to prevent um, uh, you know justice being done back in 1965 and obtain the dismemberment of the whole of the Chagos Archipelago. About 30 countries participated in those oral hearings. Canada sort of abstained from the entire process. Um, I mean, as a NATO member, it was sort of supportive of the UK and the US, but a little bit embarrassed, of course, by uh, you know a treatment of a population which was nothing sort of disgraceful uh, and, 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 in my view, manifestly illegal. In fact, Human Rights Watch has recently characterized the treatment as a crime against humanity, the first time that uh, that term has been used in relation to any actions by the United Kingdom or the United States by Human Rights Watch as an organization. In February 2019, the International Court of Justice gave its advisory opinion and it ruled in effect unanimously that what had happened in 1965 was illegal, that it violated the right of self-determination of Mauritius, it violated the rights of the population of Mauritius, including uh, the Chagossians, and that the consequence of that illegality was that the United Kingdom had to leave uh, the Chagos archipelago forthwith, immediately. The matter then went to the General Assembly of the United Nations. The General Assembly of the United Nations voted by an even bigger majority, ordering that, well, recognizing the ICJ advisory opinion as dispositive, determining that the Chagos Archipelago belonged to Mauritius, not the United Kingdom. The UN has now changed its maps, immediately changed its maps to show Chagos as part of Mauritius, not, not the United Kingdom, not disputed, and determining that the Chagossians had the right to go back. What was the response of the British government? The response of the British government was basically to stick two fingers up to the International Court of Justice. And um, so matters remained until about a year ago. Now, I would love to be able to tell you that the publication of The Last Colony in the United Kingdom, which was a bestseller on the Sunday Times uh, book list, um, played a decisive effect in changing the views of the British government. In uh, three months after the book was published, uh, the British government announced that it was going to enter into negotiations with Mauritius to resolve the matter on the basis of international law. There was, of course, an intervening event, and I think this is ultimately what had a dispositive effect. Uh, in February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine in what is a manifestly illegal war, and Russia is engaged in an illegal occupation of large parts of Ukraine. You are all aware of this. I began this presentation by talking about um, the visit by President Zelensky to Canada just a few days ago. The British and American governments have moved heaven and earth to get countries from the global south, in Africa, in South America, in Asia, to support them in dislodging Russia from its illegal occupation of Ukraine, and particularly in Africa, and I've heard this directly from African ambassadors, prime ministers, foreign ministers, this did not go down well. As one South African ambassador said to me, you can imagine our reaction, Britain comes and sees us, solicits our help in relation to the illegal occupation of Ukraine uh, by Russia, 
and we turn around and we say, oh, that's really interesting. Um, you want us to help you end one illegal occupation whilst at the same time you've stuck two fingers up to the International Court of Justice and are in illegal occupation of a large part of Africa. No, thank you. Go away. Leave us alone. And that, I think, is what caused Liz Truss in her very short tenure as prime minister, 45 days or so, to change position. And those negotiations have been underway now for about a year. And as both the British and uh, American and Russian governments have indicated, uh, so with the British and Russian governments, uh, uh, that there is there is progress in those negotiations. I, I'm not able to say any more uh, about those negotiations, but I, I'm, I'm not unduly uh, pessimistic about um, what may pass. And that is the story in a nutshell. And it is, I think, to wrap up and then we can open it up for conversation, in a sense, a pretty remarkable story at a time when you know, international law is in a sort of dispiriting state on many aspects. Here you do get a situation in which the rules of international law articulated in various international treaties and conventions, in customary international law, uh, and in particular in relation to decolonization and the right to self-determination, have had a profoundly significant effect in changing the dynamics, the political and diplomatic dynamics. Um, and over the coming months, we will see whether or not uh, that bears fruit. Um, the position of Mauritius all along has been uh, that the US base at Diego Garcia uh, may must remain, that the Chagossians uh, must be able to return if they wish to do so, that the United Kingdom must recognize the sovereignty of Mauritius over the Chagos archipelago. So it's really a story of dispossession and property, in a sense, the subject of these seminars, writ very large, uh, and one in which international law has cut in. Uh, I've skated over some of the complexities, um, but I think the best is if I stop now and we throw it open for a discussion. You know best one of the themes and uh, topics that are of interest to each of you, and I can do my best to try to address, um, you know, whatever aspects of this, in a sense, a very unhappy story, but also now perhaps slightly uplifting story um, that, that you may be interested in. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was just incredibly wonderful. Um, I can just look at the gallery here. I saw some little um, um, hands go up. But thank you so much, uh, Philippe. I agree with with Cara's comment in the in the chat that the story is so well told. I don't really know uh, what to ask about the story itself, but maybe. Uh, to have your opinion about the extent to which this might set a precedent for for international law and other contexts is there any any remarks you could you could make on that is that would that would it have implications beyond this this context thank you yeah thank you peter for that question it's obviously a very very important question um so when you're appearing before a place like the International Court of Justice, um, for those of you who are not lawyers or international lawyers, you need to understand, as I try to describe in the book, the law is not something that is mechanically applied. As, as you know from perhaps your own experiences in domestic courts, perhaps personal experiences, or following major issues before, you know, the Canadian Supreme Court, there is an intervention by humans who happen to be called judges, who bring to bear their own ideologies, their own philosophies, their own cultural approach, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that we understood in litigating the case was that we had to ring fence the issue. We had to tell the judges of the International Court of Justice, this will not set a precedent. This case is unique. There is no other case we know of in which colonial power has dismembered a part of its colony before granting independence to that colony. 
uh, in the precise circumstances that happened here. And we did that for an obvious tactical reason, um, namely that we knew the judges would have a very grave fear that if the floodgates might open with this decision, they would be much less likely to proceed in the way that they had. So that was the argument that we made. But of course, the reality was we fully understood privately that, of course, it would set a precedent. If you look at the kinds of countries that participated in those proceedings, uh, you will see Argentina, for example, hugely interested in relation to um, uh, the question of the Falklands Malvinas and other uh, parts of the world in which there is um, an argument about occupation and the right of self-determination. I, I will speak personally. I mean, frankly, I knew that if we succeeded in making the argument successfully that the right of self-determination existed under international law already in 1965 when the British had acted and that it prohibited the uh, dismemberment of a territory without the consent of the entire population concerned, that is to say all Mauritians, it would have no legal effect. It's very pertinent for Ukraine today. In um, you could, you know, if you go if you go to Ukraine, I'm off to Lviv on on Thursday. The Ukrainians will talk to you about this as an act of colonial occupation in which their right to self determination has been violated. But more uh, particularly, the General Assembly has passed another resolution in um, December 2022, following the Chagos experience in relation to Palestine. And the Palestine case is, in effect, a copycat case in which it is asking, the Palestinian Authority is asking through the General Assembly for the International Court of Justice to determine that the settlements and the occupation of the settlements is in violation of Palestine's right to self-determination and entirely without legal effect. And there are other cases, I think, that it will be in the pipeline in relation to this issue. So I think a very significant precedent has been set. There's no doubt that if you simply follow the academic scholarship on this, um, a precedent has been set. But there's one aspect of the story that I didn't have time to mention, and it was this. An advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice is not binding as such on the member states of the United Nations. It is an advisory opinion. It's binding on the United Nations. And that's why the United Nations has changed its map of the world. And But it's not binding on the United Kingdom or the United States. And so the UK government said, look, it's just an advisory opinion. We're just going to ignore it. What then happened is in the subsequent resolution, the United Kingdom somehow, I think, this is my personal view, recruited the Maldives to vote against the resolution accepting the General Assembly's, the, the ICJ's advisory opinion. And so the Maldives said, no, we vote against this. We don't accept that Chagos is part of um, Mauritius. It, it is part of the United Kingdom. That was very relevant because the um, state that is closest to the Chagos archipelago is the Maldives. And for years, Mauritius has been trying to negotiate a boundary, a maritime boundary agreement with the Maldives. So the Maldives vote allowed Mauritius to start a third case. Uh, I describe it a little bit in the last colony against um, Maldives at the law of the sea tribunal to delimit the maritime boundary. The Maldives put in a jurisdictional objection. They said, no, 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 the tribunal can't decide this dispute because there is an indispensable third party that is not before the tribunal. That is the United Kingdom. In other words, the tribunal would have to determine the rights of the United Kingdom. And since it's not a party to the case, you can't exercise jurisdiction. No, said Mauritius, that's not the case. The ICJ advisor opinion is dispositive. It binds the UN and therefore all bodies established under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And therefore there is no longer a dispute. And in January 2021, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, by eight votes to one, 
ruled that the ICJ advisory opinion was dispositive. The Chagos Archipelago is part of Mauritius, not the United Kingdom. And the Law of the Sea Tribunal can delimit a maritime boundary between the United between Mauritius and the Maldives. So that precedent is huge um, and has very significant potential consequences. So, um, I mean, if you go into the book, you will see that hanging over this entire story was an absolutely appalling decision of the International Court of Justice in 1966 in a case that is known as the Southwest Africa case, when uh, two African countries, uh, Liberia and Ethiopia, sued South Africa before the International Court of Justice for a determination of South Africa's practice of apartheid on the occupied territory of Southwest Africa, today Namibia, was contrary to international law. And almost unbelievably, by the narrowest of majorities, the International Court of Justice ruled that Liberia and Ethiopia, two black African countries, had no legal standing, had no legal interest in South Africa's treatment of the population in Namibia. It was an absolutely shameful decision. And in a sense, the 2019 advisory opinion ends that ruling of the International Court of Justice and moves us properly, I would say, in the international legal order into a post-colonial period. And that, I think, is extremely significant. It opens the door to um, many other countries seeing the International Court of Justice not as a sort of instrumentality of the European colonial powers that basically created it in 1919 uh, as part of the Treaty of Versailles. So in historical terms, it's a very significant moment what happened in 2019. Oliver, uh, you've had your hand up for some time. Uh, yeah, I think Richard was first to switch oh. on his camera. So maybe Richard, we go to you first. Sure, Richard. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. An absolutely fascinating story. Uh, remarkable. Um, my interest in it uh, comes from the fact that I re currently represent two indigenous uh, house groups of the Wet'suwet'en people in northwestern BC. And what the heck is the connection with indigenous people in the middle of the Indian Ocean? Well, <laughs> it, it comes from uh, what you mentioned, Philippe, the Banku decisions which was the early uh, attempt by the Chagossians to get justice in the English courts. And one of the principal legal arguments there was that the colony had been established using a phrase that all or many English colonies have been using for centuries, that it was established for the peace, order, and government of mm -hmm. the British Indian Ocean territories. And in the early um, high court decisions in England, the court said essentially that the previous interpretation of that phrase, that it just gave a blanket jurisdiction to the, uh, in the case of the BIOT, the, I think it was a commissioner, and in the case of Canada, to the colonial Dominion government, and then eventually uh, Canadian. It just gave them complete jurisdiction, similar to that of the English parliament. But what the court said in that uh, Banco decision is, uh, I, I'm paraphrasing, that the peace order and government provision was a very large tapestry, but every tapestry has a border. And it said essentially that removing the entire population exceeded the 
powers given by the phrase peace, order, and good government. Now, to go back to the people in Northwestern British Columbia that uh, I represent, they are suing the Canadian government, uh, saying that the government's uh, inability to limit greenhouse gases is causing climate change. Climate change is affecting their territories, which um, their whole identity, their self-determination is strictly and absolutely related to. It's affecting their health. Um, and they seize on the wording from the Supreme Court of Canada that climate change, so-called, is an existential threat. And they are arguing that the survival of that colonial phrase, peace, order, and government, into the Canadian Constitution, uh, those words, peace, order, and good government, have real meaning. And they are relying uh, on the Banco, Banku Court's decision uh, for that. Now, this case has been going for three years, three and a half years already. It's still at the stage where the uh, Wet'suwet'en house groups are trying to get the courts to actually hear the case on its merits. So far, the arguments have been uh, on whether the case is justiciable. Uh, the court saying climate change is a political decision. The Wet'suwet'en are saying, no, it's a legal decision. They are relying on the Charter of Rights in the Canadian Constitution, but they're also relying on this uh, peace order and good government argument that is in the Canadian Constitution. And so it's interesting that Indigenous peoples in Northwestern British Columbia um, have some commonality with Indigenous people in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So that's what uh, drew me to your talk, Philip. And uh, it, it was fascinating. And that same uh, imperative of colonial governments, and I would argue as well, state governments to uh, override the responsibilities that they themselves created through colonization and we would argue uh, constitutional provisions. So thank you very much. I mean, Richard, there's so many fascinating issues there. I mean, of course, I'm I'm not knowledgeable on the case law that you're talking about in Canada or um, or the Charter of Rights. I, I I think one of the things that's been interesting for me, I've of course focused on this from the international law side. And one of the consequences of all of this is that, in a sense, the rulings in the series of cases in relation to Banku, which were premised on the United Kingdom having sovereignty over the British Indian Ocean Territory, have been put entirely to one side, in a sense, um, in a straight conflict between English law and international law, in which, as a matter of English law, it prevails, and as a matter of international law, international law prevails. So you've got here you know, in a dualist system, a straight contradiction. I think that the rulings of Banku that you are placing reliance on persist. I thought you were going to head in a different direction, which is how did the International Court of Justice deal with the claims of some of the Chagossian, members of the Chagossian community, that they themselves are an indigenous group? And this has been enormously complex. Um, th there are, I mean, 
the Tregosian community, which is a wonderful community, and I, I, I am deeply respectful of the wide range of views that are held, basically divide into three groups. There's one group largely in Mauritius, um, led by Olivier Bancou, who say, look, the only show in town is Mauritius. That's the only way we're going to get back. We've got to go with the Mauritius argument that Mauritius has sovereignty, and that is what the international law has ruled. So we go with that argument. Then there is a very large community of Chagossians based in the United Kingdom who say, no, we don't like the way Mauritius has treated us. We're better off in the United Kingdom and we're better off resisting the ICJ decision and calling for the United Kingdom to remain, calling for Chagos to remain part of the United Kingdom. Now, I don't know. I have a suspicion that that feeling is motivated in part by allegations of mistreatment by Mauritius of the Chagossian community upon its arrival and thereafter, but also by a fear that if they somehow turn against the British government, they may find themselves at risk of deportation, um, you know, a la Windrush, which has happened extraordinarily. And I could quite understand that there is a concern about that in members of the Chagossian community. And then there's a third group who say, no, we don't accept Mauritius. We don't accept the United Kingdom. We are an indigenous group. We want an independent state of Chagos. Um, and 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 that's, you know, it's not a large group, but it's not, a, you know, a completely tiny group. Um, and And that is another argument that is put. Now, the way international law proceeds is that you have to take the situation as it was in 1965. And, and in a sense, this is a sort of reification of colonial boundaries. But you have to look at the boundaries that existed at the time that decolonization happened. And you, ca you can't begin to say, well, you know, there's a little part of Mauritius that can secede from the rest of Mauritius without the consent of the whole of Mauritius. It's basically the Quebec argument. The, the, the Canadian Constitutional Court applied really international law on self-determination and said the whole of Canada has to express a view on whether or not Quebec can secede. We've got it right now in the United Kingdom with Scotland. Scotland cannot determine for itself as a matter of English law, but frankly also as a matter of international law, whether or not to secede from the United Kingdom. It needs Westminster to grant its consent to have a referendum, to take a decision, whatever. And, and this raises for me, here I'm speaking, you know, independently as a sort of academic, a, a, re a real question about the way in which international law has set in concrete the colonial boundaries that happened to exist post-1945. You know, and we know that the colonial boundaries drove a co coach and horses through, you know, tribal communities and indigenous communities and created all sorts of incredibly artificial uh, arrangements. And so I find myself torn on the one hand, between, of course, welcoming the approach, which is motivated by a desire for stability. And on the other hand, a concern that it sets in stone, essentially the European colonial settlement of the 18th and 19th centuries, and that is deeply problematic. So the issues that you're raising, of course, arise in the context of domestic Canadian law, domestic English law, but I think there's a broader resonance with how international law effectively sets in stone territorial and boundary arrangements that may in some cases be deeply problematic. Um, and that I think it is, um, you know, coming back to the precedent question, potentially very problematic. Uh, so I think one has to, you know, in a scholarly community, recognize that the legitimacy of that concern. I think it's a real issue. Thank you. Oliver. Philip, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and you know quite an astonishing story of success yeah. with the legal case that from the outset seemed to be almost implausible to pursue. But you know, you you took us through the different stages, and and I'm still trying to wrap my head around. You know, uh, if you could 
give us a sense of what in the end allowed this case to move all the way to where it is now and have this level of success. You know, you know, you you talked a little bit about political opportunities in the international arena, Brexit, Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia conflict. Um, but you also took us back a little you know, to your own education in the 70s, right? And the and the uh, and the public awareness of the legacy of colonialism that was widely absent, right? And there was no public interest. So I'm wondering whether you can reflect on the interaction between legal proceedings and you know the wider um social change that we see, education, of which in your book is very much part of. Um, it have we reached a level of um of understanding and of, of greater shared knowledge about colonialism that allows these cases to go forward? Do you see a kind of a change in the overall societal um, environment that um, makes it more promising to take these legal cases forward? So if you reflect back on your upbringing, the UK, right here in terms of the knowledge about these injustices, and where we are now, do you see that things have changed and what accounts for the astonishing success of your, your case? So maybe just if you could, yeah. in a way, situate your legal struggles in the wider social environment, political environment. Uh, it's, a, it's an app. I think about this a lot. It's a really great question. Um, I mean, there's so much that I could say. The, fir the first thing is, have things fundamentally changed? They have not changed fundamentally in the United Kingdom. I don't believe. Um, why do I say that? Well, so, so you know, I've written a lot of academic books with academic presses that I'm really proud of. They're part of my life. And then 10 years ago, I started writing books about international law for a, for a broader audience, partly because I wanted to break out of the academic community to reach a broader audience because I felt the academic community alone would not be able to protect what I the values I cared about in the legal order. And so East West Street, the rat line, the last colony were about reaching a broader audience, along with Lawless World and Torture Team. They were about reaching that broader audience. It's been utterly fascinating to compare the domestic experience in the United Kingdom of writing a book like East West Street, which is essentially about the period of 39 to 45, with Germans and Nazis at the forefront and Ukraine and Poles and Jews and so on and so forth, with a book about British colonialism. So, you know, the level of interest in the United Kingdom, media, television, radio, newspapers, when you write a book about East West Street or that, you know, it's just stratospheric. Everyone wants to talk to you. Everyone wants to interview you. You know, the sales are ridiculous. Write a book about British colonial history. Same author, same style. I think a pretty horrible story. And there is interest. It made it briefly onto the Sunday Times bestseller list, but it's quite clear that the level of interest is much less. Um, in the United Kingdom, people don't want to know about our own colonial past and our own colonial horrors. I see it. There are far less requests for interviews, far less requests to be on the radio, far less requests to go to literary literary festivals i mean it's still a, a you know very nice level of interest that i think any academic will be perfectly happy with but it's very different and one of the things that i've come to understand from that is the obsession with nazism in britain is actually a way of making britain feel better about itself look there's these characters who did things that were even worse <laughs> than what we did and so we don't have to talk about slavery. We don't have to talk about colonialism. Let's focus on Nazi Germany or communism or Stalin or whatever, because, and I don't think that has fundamentally changed. And, and that actually has been a bit dispiriting. Why was this a successful outcome? I think in part, it is that the zeitgeist has changed, definitely in the international arena. This was the first time I'm told by Ambassador Kunjul that all 54 countries of the of Africa voted together in the General Assembly of the UN. There were no divisions. And that unanimity and consensus is very, very rare, I'm told. Why did that happen? Because it was about British colonialism in Africa, and that really caused them to act together. So there was that political element. But equally, there was a human element. 
Um, let me give you one example. And, and it, it's, it's very complex to write about this because in the world of traditional public international law scholarship, you don't say what I'm about to say. The law books, the treatises basically describe international law as something that is mechanically applied. It doesn't matter who the judges are. Of course it matters who the judges are. We know it matters who the judges are. And we had the great fortune of having, as the president of the International Court of Justice, when this case came on, a remarkable jurist from Somalia, a man called Abdul Aki Yusuf, who'd been the legal advisor of UNESCO, who grew up in Somalia under Italian occupation, singing Italian songs, and knew all about the colonial experience. And I got that not from my own observation but from talking to Liz B. Elysee. I remember at one point I said to her, how did you feel when you came to court the first time for the hearings? And she said, well, I felt safe because there was an African man presiding over the case, a black African man. I felt safe. And then I said, what about the judgment? Did you, did you have any sense when he came in? Because none of us knew what, what was going to happen. Did you have eye contact with him? Was there any... You know, in a courtroom, it's one of the things that's never really articulated or explained in the legal literature. It's one of the limitations of law as an academic discipline is in a courtroom. There is a conversation that takes place that's not articulated through verbal means. There are silences, raised eyebrows, looks, exchanges. And, and I said, did you did you have eye contact? And she said, we did. When he came in, he looked at me and I said, how did you feel? And she said, I felt good. I said, I felt it was going to be okay. The way he looked at me, I knew. And I think that a case like that being presided over by an individual with that background would have been very, very different if it had been presided over, uh, you know, by most, let us say, white British public international lawyers. Because at the end of the day, there's a very human story at the heart of this case. But I think we have to accept that ultimately the entire story reflects a country which is in manifest decline. If Britain was on the up, if Britain was strong, if Britain had a sense of moral leadership in the world, the, the, the resolution would never have got through the General Assembly. They, they would have stopped it. They would have found ways. They would have made their usual calls and they would have got prime ministers and presidents and foreign ministers to say, OK, we'll support you. We'll, we'll block this. It didn't happen. And it didn't happen, not just because of Brexit, but Brexit signalled a country whose international reputation had fallen off the edge of a cliff. It could no longer call on the kinds of resources and support and friendship that it had before. And I think in that sense, this entire story does reflect a sort of turn on its axis of the international order and where the power lies. In you know these cases, as you'll see from the book, it's not a case of just trying to get the resolution through and then turning up in court. There's a huge amount of work that goes into the vote at the General Assembly. Who's going to appear at the International Court of Justice? We knew, for example, it was incredibly important that China and Russia not oppose this initiative. They could have opposed it, you know. It was incredibly important that South Africa, India and Brazil participate in the hearings in support of Mauritius and the African Union, because that would send a signal to the judges that this was truly a global matter in which there was broad support. And all of that was achieved, not because of the work of the lawyers, but because of the work of Ambassador Kunjul, who's a seasoned diplomat who, you know, pulled in his contacts and arranged things in an absolutely masterly way. And frankly, that is in part the consequence <laughs> of a continuing hubristic colonial attitude by people in the United Kingdom who thought, oh, it's this little African country, you know, these people, black people who are going to try to go to the General Assembly and, you know, beat us at our own game and it'll be quite easy to do it. 
and and the world's changed it's really really changed um and i think that my answer to your question is it's a mix of strategy of accident of changing political powers and i think some remarkable lawyering by the Chagossians in a series of cases that lasted 20 years. Um, and a, you know, I do want to say this, an extraordinary team in Port Louis, you know, six or seven civil servants and lawyers who are as fine professionals as I've ever come across. I mean, seriously superb. Um and 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 that's an eye opener. I think it's a it's a reflection on a changing world. So in the end, this entire story leaves me feeling somewhat uplifted and somewhat positive about the future at a time when international law is, um, you know, not in a great place. It's one of those positive lights, um, and 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 so it's a mixed. It's a very complex question, Yvonne. It's a fascinating question. And and I think the dust needs to settle as to what was it about this story? What was the confluence of circumstances that caused this to happen? And I think it's this mix of factors, personal, individual, political, ideological, global, that caused the change to happen. It's a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I ha oh, just a second. Tara. Hi, yes, thanks so much um, for the, for both your story and for your answers to the questions of which have my mind buzzing um, in many different ways. Um, I'm not, I don't have this question where f well formulated, but I'm curious about, the, there was a turning point in the story where the environment, the inform the marine protected area was being used as a mechanism to sort of reinforce the, the colonial <laughs> Which is, of course, a, a, a very common thing in a, a, a kind of history of Amer of international environmentalism or conservation. It's not a new move. Um, but there's a lot of also interesting cases emerging of marine protected areas providing a lever in the other direction of, of, of for example, Indigenous people shaping marine protected areas in a way that actually support and enhance their own um, their own claims to the to the land and resources. Um, so I just wonder if there's anything happening of that kind in this context. So whether I mean I'm sure you're seeing many strategic pathways potentially opening up over the next five years. I just wonder if there's any along those lines. No, that's so interesting, Kara. The answer is yes. Um, so Mauritius, from the get go. I mean, as you probably know, I teach international environmental law. So I found myself in this really curious position. I'm sort of in favor of marine protected areas but proper marine protected areas that respect the communities that are most directly affected by them and don't amount to the imposition, if you like, of a colonial, you know, settlement. And so all along, the government, successive governments of Mauritius have said, no, 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 we, we, we absolutely, you know, we've killed off the British marine protected area, but, but we want a proper marine protected area. And I'm very pleased about that. And it would have caused for me very real difficulties if the government of Mauritius had said, no, we're getting rid of the marine protected area, we're going to, you know, exploit oil and gas and mine minerals and do all. I mean, I'd, that would have been really personally very troubling for me. On the other hand, it seems to me that the true stewards, I mean, we, we went, one of the things I haven't talked about in this conversation is in February 2022, we went to Chagos for the first time. Mauritius organized an expedition to the Chagos archipelago. We were 25 on the boat, you know, scientists, diplomats, lawyers, the biggest group of five Chagossians, including Liz Bielise and Olivier Boncou. And I think I can honestly say it was the most extraordinary trip I've ever taken in my whole life. And I, you know, I travel a lot, I go to some amazing places. I've never seen anything like it. It's just beyond extraordinary. It's we had to sail for six days to get there. It, you know, six days there, six days back. We spent five days there. And being back on the island with the Chagossians, you can go on the web and just see the arrival moment. I mean, it's, it was it was overwhelming. But you understand this is a remarkable place. And, and once you've been there, 
you understand it's their place. And the obvious solution in the way forward is for the Chagossian community that returns to be entrusted with the stewardship of their own land, so to speak. And I think one of the things that I will be looking out for, and the signs are very positive, is that the Chagossians will be given a central role in determining the future marine protected area. It's their waters, it's their coral reefs, it's their lands, they know it, it's in their blood, they understand what it needs to look after it. And I think that's what you need to look forward to in the next phase. They're going to go back, plainly, they're going to go back, in my view, there's no question, and they're going to go back pretty soon. They are the true stewards. And, and that is the thing to look for. And that is the thing that one needs to be bellyaching about if it doesn't happen. Um, will they be given a central role in the design and application of the regulations that will protect that extraordinary marine environment? Um, and I think th if that happens, then it's really a fabulous outcome. Um, if it doesn't happen, and here I'm obviously speaking personally, it would be very problematic um, for me, you know, having attacked the British MPA as an expression of colonial power, basically, to have that replaced by, you know, something that's akin to what came before would be, for me personally, deeply, deeply problematic. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, all the signs are positive, but I think that's that's what you should be looking out for. That's the thing to look out for. I really think it's worth focusing on it. I, I think you spend time on these kinds of issues and it's going to be a fascinating thing. There's going to be a stakeholders meeting, I think some point next year to design the MPA. The Chagossians, of course, will be given a central role in that. And I'd really urge you to get involved and, you know, follow it and, and go to the stakeholders meeting in Mauritius and as an example of something that could be really significant. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic on this. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I'm optimistic. Thank you. It's lovely to have an optimistic answer. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that we're sort of running out of time. So are there any other questions from people? In that case, it's it call, it's called upon me to step in with the question I've been wanting to ask ever since I opened um, this um, talk, and it's something you said in response to um, to Oliver when I was doing the introduction. I was making the point that we've just had a few days of Canada as a nation engaging in truth and reconciliation. Is there any, I mean, you, you, was, you gave a slightly pessimistic response to Oliver about what life is like in the United Kingdom at the moment on these sorts of right. it's It's dreadful. Right. It's a country, <laughs> so I suppose, it's a country that is in a state of collapse. Yeah. So, it's I mean, depressing. is there any um, movement of, of, you know, who knows, you know, um, any talk that that um, issues of truth and reconciliation need, need to at least be engaged with in Britain in the way that post-colonial societies like Canada, after a long, long time, are trying at least yeah. to do. So this is, again, another really interesting question. And I think this is one of the aspects of Chagos that I find so fascinating is all of these questions have taken different directions but 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 each one is very interesting in its own right. And 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 your question is one that I've been thinking about a lot. How does Brit and um, focusing on Britain move to the next stage? And it relates to the partly the answer that I gave to Oliver earlier. Unlike other countries, I'm thinking in particular, I mean, let's take another case of colonialism with terrible consequences. The treatment of the Herero in Southwest Africa in the early 1900s by German colonizers. 
So Germany has not just engaged with its past in relation to the Holocaust. It has also engaged with the past in terms of its mistreatment of the Herrera. And it has characterized its own actions in 1908 as a genocide, which is really very significant because genocide as a concept, as you know, was only invented in 1945. And so it is effectively the retroactive application of a legal term to something that happened before that term was invented, which opens the door to a lot of consequences. If you can have a genocide happening in 1908, why not 1808? Why not 1608? And that makes some countries really nervous, like the United Kingdom, for example. And the Germans have done that, and they've recognized that they need to make financial sums available, and they've offered the government of Namibia 1 billion euros to make amends for what has happened in the past but they don't want to call it compensation or reparation which has caused the um government of namibia to say well thank you very much but we don't want it uh, unless you call it compensation or reparation and you can sort of understand from the german position they know that once they call it compensation or reparation the floodgates open and and and, and so that's a big question about how we move forward and the united kingdom of course, you know, the R word, reparation, of course, the nightmare for the United Kingdom is enslavement. You know, oh, my God. You know, if we start paying little bits of compensation for little bits of colonial misdeeds in Kenya or in Chagos or wherever, the floodgates will open. And so that door is just firmly shut. And because that door has been firmly shut, there's no reckoning. There's no accounting. There's no proper discussion. There are many people in Britain who want to open that door. There are many people who believe that until Britain begins to engage in a truth and reconciliation of its own in relation to its own past, it will pursue this spiral of decline that will go on and on and on. You can take one particular example, Northern Ireland. OK, now, a lot of people are talking about truth and reconciliation for Northern Ireland. What does this government want to do? It wants to shut down access to the courts in relation to claims brought against misdeeds by British soldiers, but not the other side. And it doesn't want to adopt a truth and reconciliation mechanism so that there is some sort of narrative accounting of what happened. It's catastrophic and it reflects a country that is fearful, that is not comfortable about its past, that worries about its past. I mean, you get this in many countries. I follow to a certain extent what's going on in Canada. I follow to a certain extent what's going on in Ireland in terms of, you know, child abuse. Uh, some of the things that happened in the early parts of the 20th century. I think the broad issue here and probably every community knows about this issue, every family knows about this issue, every town knows about this issue, every country knows about this issue, is when things went wrong, how do you come to terms with it? What are the various mechanisms in dealing with it? And Britain has not even begun to engage with an honest reckoning. And particularly with this current regime, it's all about the glories of empire and the glories of, you know, the 18th and 19th century and somehow recreating that. It's the very opposite of what is needed. I think Britain will, I think Britain has many wonderful qualities and many, many wonderful people across the political spectrum. But it won't begin to move forward in a decent way unless it finds an honest reckoning with what has come before and it hasn't even begun to do it Philip, thank you so much for an absolutely stunning um presentation and i encourage every single person to go straight online now and get their own copy of the last colony um and but i know that we have to um uh wind up so on behalf of everybody who's come, thank you so much indeed. And I know we all enjoyed it so very, very much. So thank you. Thank you very much.